I'm Ija Sun. I'm from North Vancouver, Canada. And uh, I'm a family doctor and I'm trained in medical acupuncture. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It's because you don't get a lot of doctors trained in acupuncture. No. So you're the perfect balance between yeah. Eastern and Western. And then I was introduced to the Human Garage in mm -hmm. early January of this year. Mm -hmm. And after a few days of, of doing it, I noticed uh, I could tell immediately what the effect was, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, working on subconscious layers, trauma. But after three days of doing this, literally, I met Gary very randomly and serendipitously in a restaurant in Vancouver that I never go to. And, uh, you know, such resonance and such passion. Of course, we had to meet again. And so here we are in Mexico. And thank you. What are some of the most common pelvic floor issues you see? Incontinence. Incontinence. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk. And that, that's happening with even young women today, right? Younger, like in their 40s? Uh, it can be. Yeah. And it can happen after pregnancy, after, pregnancy, right? after, after pregnancy, after childbirth. Yeah. After childbirth, yeah. More women are becoming proactive in doing their pelvic floor during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So more women are becoming uh, proactive. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, so most people don't know, but we have four layers of muscle and fascia for the pelvic floor, or for the abdominal wall. So if I isolate this, look at this. That's my abs right over here. So most people don't know that. Um, so let's take that off. Let's hide that one and see how, and what I like to point out is all the striations or all the method of movement is different on each one. So if we isolate this, I just want to show you guys what you're made of. See how far that one comes back? That's kind of cool. And then we will take that off. Then we go here. <coughs> Whoops. We isolate that one. We'll fade it. Uh, isolate. So then this one here, this is where, this is where we get the hole, this is where the belly button goes. So this one, this layer is so that we can rotate around. So the other layers are about force going left and right, up and down. This one is actually rotational. There's actually a, a gap there. Yeah, a gap yeah. for the belly button. Mm -hmm. And this one, you see how far it goes back over here? That's mm -hmm. what I love. And, and we don't normally, like, even when we study anatomy, we don't look at it this way normally because we used to have to look at anatomy books. Anatomy books were really frustrating because you have five books out to get the same picture. So this is what I believe helped me understand the human body. All right. Okay, now here, here is the infamous 10-pack. Now, I uh, traded my six-pack or my 10-pack in for a keg when I got out of high school. So my keg was, I wanted a one-pack. <laughs> so, so we'll get rid of that. So I wanted everybody to see this and see what it looks like. Because most people don't get a chance. This is the greater momentum. This is where... All of the nutrients goes into the bloodstream from the organs. It doesn't look this way when we were talking about this last night. It doesn't really look like this when we do an autopsy um, or a cadaver lab. So if I hide that, now I get all the squiggly tissue. I'm going to get rid of these ones real quick just so we can talk about it. It's a little skill. And then, of course, we have the lily alba. Um, this here is a ligament that keeps our internal integrity. So when a woman gets pregnant, what happens here is this guy stretches out. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the major causes of diastasis recti. Mm -hmm. And this ligament here, when we put it back here, it has all these pulling sensations because it stretches this way and this way. So this is a common issue is seeing the diastasis recti in women. So fascial maneuvers can be good for repairing that? Right, yes. Non-surgically. Non-surgically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, look at my diastasis recti. I mean, I went from, I went from having the big belly mm -hmm. to having, and, and what's, what's important, when I got rid of my belly, I actually had that little line up underneath the belly button. Looks like I had excess weight. Well, that all went away too. So eventually this can all go away. And usually what we do for this is we just this, we do the belly button torque. We put our finger in there and torque this way. We do the ileocecal valve release here, the partnered one. And this starts to let all of these areas here, this area here, lets all of this friction go here. Because we torque it like this, it torques like this. So it winds it up and then lets it elastically go back. So pretty cool. Again, it's just a winding motion, right? Okay, so let's get rid of the, this. Okay, so now we have the intestines. Now, why do we have all of these different versions of intestines, little areas? I mean, we, we kind of know what some of the functions are, but I don't believe we know what them all. But if I isolate this, that's pretty interesting. So this is the very, the very first part as it's coming in right from the stomach. 
So this area here is where it gets a lot of processing power, a lot of stuff done. So like when this area is agitated, I feel it in my organs. Like I'll feel it in my throat. I'll feel it in my neck. I'll feel it tension ha happen right away. But I find that in my experience, this area here is where all the skin conditions start to come up. Mm -hmm. Helium. Again, it's a little, little different, but this is like through the whole front of the stomach and it's covering other organs. So let's get rid of these. Okay. Now we have our, we have our ascending, our transverse and our descending colon. And we have the ligament, which goes over the uterus. This, this is a ligament. And this ligament here is super powerful. It's maintaining the pelvic floor structure. So let's, let's take that out. It's isolated here. So you can see what it looks like. That's what it looks like. It's pretty cool. Look at that little hole up there. That's where it goes in. It's pretty cool when you think about it. Uh, how is this constructed? And look at there, even so it carries the fallopian tubes. Mm -hmm. So the fallopian tubes can easily get dislodged out of there. And when we do that, we feel pain. Like a, it almost feels like somebody's pressing in there or it feels like a gas pain quite often. Okay, and I don't know that because I don't have it, but I've experienced lots of women that I've helped resolve it. Okay, and so on top of the ligament, we've got the bladder, and we've got the uterus. Now the bladder, uh, now what happens, what I've experienced is, is as the pelvis tilts forward, the bladder starts to push against here. And the fat and the bladder gets stuck right on the pelvic floor. That's quite often the, one of the biggest issues. So if the pl bladder gets stuck on the pelvic floor, here I'll show you what it does. In my experience, if the bladder gets stuck right here, right here. So it pulls the, the hips anterior. So it pulls it forward. So you notice a lot of women pulling with the anterior and the shoulders rolling mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Very, very common. So that's an issue. So let's get right into, okay. So here, let's take out the bladder here. And then by the way, just for you women who haven't seen this, when this gets bigger here, it's going to push against there. That makes sense why you've got to go pee all the time. Mm -hmm. And if the bladder, if this here gets dysregulated, if the hips are forward, this can easily push into the bladder, causing me to have to go to the bathroom. Or you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you experience that? Yes, after childbirth. I think most mothers experience going frequently. Do you experience it during your cycle? Not, Maybe not, not you. Me. Yeah, yeah, but you're very well moving. Mm -hmm. But the other women experience, mm -hmm. uh, we'll call them period shits, they call them. <laughs> <laughs> or the movements. Because also when that gets big, it pushes against here, which is your, which is your colon right up against here. And there's some dis debate. I'm going to open that up right now to how big this gets during the cycle. I have looked at it on, um, ultrasound, ultrasound and I've found that it gets to about 50% bigger. Um, and there's this peer review that says it only grows three or 4%. Does that seem logical to you that it only grows three or 4%? Could be. Could be. Yeah. But it could be also could getting be bigger. Also bigger. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so when what happens when some women get really bloated and some women don't? It's true. A lot of women do experience that they are bloating more. We always associate bloating with gas, but this idea that it could be the uterus that they're actually feeling. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and it can be gas too. It's 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 both of those. Mm -hmm. So let's take the bladder out. By the way, when I, remember I said it, it's a. So I'll hide it. But see, there you go. There's, there's the inside of the bladder too. And that's pretty interesting when you think about it because the bladder actually separates right in the front. Remember I said all the organs that move us, uh, fear is one of the motivators, which is the bladder, is one unit that has two sides. It's kind of interesting. So, so let's take a look at this. Okay, there, there it is. See the uterus here. It comes, now the bladder was right in here. So if the, as the uterus here starts to enlarge, then it pushes right down on top of the bladder, pushing it forward. Yeah. That's, that's where, that's where we feel a lot of the pressure. That's where we feel a lot of pain, especially during pregnant. Okay. Now what about a tilted uterus? What do you see in practice? You've seen, do you actually recognize tilted uterus? On a clinical exam, but never, you know, in Western medicine, I don't think we go beyond just. Uh, it's tilted. Yeah. We'll go, it's tilted. Yeah. But regardless of what that means for a woman's experience. What does that mean when in Eastern medicine in practice? Like for tilted, do you do something about it or? 
Mm, no, you know, the only the only thing that I've done for women with um, prolapse issues yeah. is treating the, to the top of the, the head. The top of the head. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Okay. You actually use needles for that. And moxibustion. Oh, moxibustion. Yeah. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a mox that you burn. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that burn their hair? You have to be above their hair. <laughs> okay. So, so what is it in your definition? What is a prolapse? What is it? What is it actually doing? Well, just the heaviness, sinking, something that's no longer held where it's need to be. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's get some stuff out of here. Let's look at what a prolapse looks like, okay? Uh, let, let me take off some muscles here. Let's get rid of the muscles for a second. That way it's a little easier to see. Okay, there, you know, get rid of some bones here. That's, that's a better way to sit. So this uterus here has this shape. So a prolapse would be a malfunction here causing this to get heavy and come down there. Mm-hmm. So what could happen? What could be the cause of that? Well, look how this is influenced by the hips, the spine, and right here by the lower colon. So if I had colon issues, a lot of women today are only going to bowel movement sometimes every second, or every third day. Mm-hmm. So if I have a bowel movement every second or third day, what's going to happen is... I'm going to get a buildup of poop in there. I know what you're saying. No shit. But yes. So I'm going to get buildup there. That's going to push on the uterus. And if that pushes on the uterus, then that's going to cause the potential of a prolapse. Mm -hmm. So, So this is one reason we want people to have a bowel movement every day. Minimum actually one per day, but we want two or three or even four movements a day. Okay. And why the squatting is so important. Right, because when we squat, it opens up the pelvis and it allows the pressure to come off because the, because the, the rectum starts to fold underneath the uterus. So the rectum, the uterus stays sit, and when we squat the pelvis, so the rectum comes underneath the uterus. And so it actually uses that power to, to get rid of it. That's why we should have a squatty potty. Yeah. So if you want to look at squatty potty, go look at squatty potty. The video is one of the best videos I've ever seen. So on YouTube, it's got millions of views. You ever seen it? I haven't, but I know what they are. Mm-hmm. Guys, yeah, this is why you should use a squatty potty. This is where your ice cream comes from. Oh, the creamy poop of a mystic unicorn. Totally clean, totally cool, and soft serve straight from a sphincter. Mm, they're good at pooping. But you know who sucks at pooping? You do. That's because when you sit on a porcelain drone, this muscle puts a kink in the hose and stops the Ben and Jerry's from sliding out smoothly. Is that a problem? I don't know. Are hemorrhoids a problem? Because sitting at this angle can cause hemorrhoids, bloating, constipation, and a butt of all that crap. And seriously, unicorn hemorrhoids? The glitter gets everywhere. But what happens when you go from a sit to a squat? Voila, this muscle relaxes and that kink goes away faster than Pegasus Lane, sweet Sherbet Dukey. Now your colon's open and ready for battle. That's because our bodies were made to poop in a squat, and now there's a product that lets you squat in your own home. Introducing the Squatty Potty. <laughs> no, Squatty Potty is not a joke. And yes, it will give you the best poop of your life, guaranteed. I don't just mean you bloated lords and hemorrhoidal ladies. I mean everyone. <laughs> kink, unkink. Kink, unkink. It's simple science, really. Can't get the last scoop out of the carton. With a squatty potty, you get complete elimination. <laughs> Spend too much time on the chamber pot. The squatty potty makes it go twice as fast for your money back. I stream, you stream, and plop, plop, baby. Maybe you're sore from squeezing out solid globs of rocky road. The squatty potty gives you a smooth stream of bro that glides like a virgin swan. We got is that the- an official commercial? That is an official commercial. <laughs> And it has been removed, uh, viewed 41 million times. Why you should have a squatty potty? Because that little, that little line here pulls, that muscle pulls right around there. And that, and that also when we pull down there, it separates the rectum from the, uh, uterus. Because if the rectum sits on the uterus and fascia is sticky, it's going to stick there. It's going to adhere because it thinks the body thinks it wants to be there. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So. The, the way that we stop the adhesions is we keep the body hydrated. When the fascia is dehydrated even slightly, adhesions happen more. And that's why movement gets harder when we're dehydrated because there's more adhesions in the fascia. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so let's get back to this. Prolapse uterus. So if my uterus is tilted, this way. Okay, so what would that look like if the uterus was tilted this way? 
So what that means is in mechanics, let me take all of it off here. I'm going to take off the digestion and all this stuff. So let's just talk about some mechanics here. Okay. So if my prolapse, if my uterus is going this way, and then it goes this way, that means my hip has to be actually open up this way. So this hip is going to be higher and this hip is going to be lower. Now, almost everybody in the world has one higher hip and one lower hip. If it's dramatic, like a scoliosis, you're going to get a, you're going to get a tilted uterus. Now, tilted, tilted uterus doesn't mean you're not going to conceive, but it's one of the causes of, of, of conception issues. And um, who just wants their uterus tilted? I don't know. Do you want your uterus tilted? <laughs> okay. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about adhesions on the pelvic floor. So I've I've spent the last twelve years using this to explain anatomy to people so that they could see it another way. I wish doctors could use something like this when they're counseling patients. They should, especially surgeons. You know, the surgeon so should. many people are consenting to things and still not understanding. That that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. I consenting to a surgery, but I don't understand what that surgery looks like. Mm -hmm. And if I understood the mechanics of it, would I still do the surgery? You know, speaking to doctors and teasing away all the layers, would they start to think differently about what they were doing? Well, I think if most doctors looked at it this way, this is how I learned the body. Yeah. I, le I, I knew the body. I learned it here in the field. Like I touched the yeah. body and then I go look on here and so say, what did I touch? This is functional anatomy where I think we're still stuck in just the gross anatomy. Gross. You know, very simplistic. Yeah, very yeah. simplistic view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so here's our pelvic floor, but here's some funny ones, okay? So you, these ones here, they wrap, this This is like so, in this tissue right in here. So this is really super important. Women who have a very, very tight neck, right around the base of the neck, this is tight. Now, I'm going to suggest that women can stretch this out, like in a bathtub. I put I put one one finger here and one finger here when I'm in a bathtub sitting and I pull it apart and move my body. So this stretches this out and stretches this out. That's going to help a lot. It, it's also it's also a big issue with women who have, have pain during sex because there's going to be contraction around here. That's the first area of contraction. And But I want to show you something. I want to show you where this sucker goes to. So what happens is it goes right up into the rectum. So it's all connected here and it goes right up into the mm -hmm. rectum. And so if I have... If I have, uh, if I have my hips off, so let's, here, let's do this. So if I have my hips off and this hip is higher, guess what happens to my rectum? My rectum starts to tilt inside. Mm -hmm. So same thing. So that's a big issue for, for women. And, and I, I encourage women and men to go in there in the bathtub, grab those areas around the rectum, pull them, squeeze them and breathe. We shouldn't be afraid to touch our bodies. People are like, it's going to break. Is that, I get this all the time. Is it safe to do that on my body? I'm like, if you're asking whether touching your body is safe, we have a real problem. What's your opinion on kegels? Because that's what's being done. Well, kegels is to try and strengthen something, but muscles lose strength because they're restricted from fascia. Mm -hmm. So we unrestrict the fascia and then the muscles regain the strength. So we're doing kegels, which works. Exactly. But... If you really want the ultimate kegel is release what's causing the muscle not to be able to. Which is what we're experiencing, you know, in other aspects of our body. You know, when you're showing me this, I'm just thinking of all the, the, the hemorrhoid clinics and the vulvodynia clinics and all these very specialized clinics that are focusing on these areas when here you're offering something. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about hemorrhoids because hemorrhoids <laughs> are just liver issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that from, from Chinese medicine. Okay, so, but here's what I want people to see. It's okay, so if I take this muscle here. Now, there's fascia all around this. This all exists in there. If I isolate this and come all the way around, look at that muscle. Look, it goes right from the front. It goes all the way around and it affects your tailbone. So, how many people have a tailbone off? So, this is very common. Most people's tailbone will go that way. Most people's tailbone will go to the left, generally. And their, and their xiphoid will go to the right because it's balancing off, but well, that's going to affect the pelvic floor mm -hmm. and it's going to affect the, where, how the uterus and everything sits on there as well. Okay, so let's take a look at some other ones, which are nasty ones, which we don't even think of. Like we go back in here, okay, this is the, so I've noticed that the body has like three. So we have a glute max, min, and med. Do you know that there's only one muscle that's not common? It's like, do you know that the psoas minor is only generally an Afro African-American people. 
Yeah, it's uh, black or African American have so as minor. That's why in the 30s, that's why they didn't want to have them in the Olympics because it gives the body an advantage in propulsion. Isn't that funny, eh? <clears throat> Taking all the gender or the, the race issues out, we do have some differences biologically. So here, that's the glute uh, major. There is the glutus uh, medius. And then under there is the minimus. Now, the way that the body works is this fires, transfers the force to the medius, that transfers the force to the maximus. But if my, if my pelvis is tilted, <clears throat> this muscle here is strained and I don't get the proper glute firing. So in order to get my glutes firing properly, I need to then clear it out. This is what fascial maneuvers will do because when we rotate the hips, the hips and the shoulders, it lets this drop back down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take, let's take some funny ones. Like, okay, so I wanna get in, okay, one of these ones. Okay, here it is, the quad, uh, quadratus femoris. Okay, if I isolate this, <clears throat> okay, so this one here, controls it's so powerful so if this hip goes high then this guy is automatic automatically going to get stretched out because the hip goes this way so it stretch, stretches away and causes issue in here now when we re relate that back to the pelvic floor what that's going to do is it's going to cause a contraction of these fibers here to go the opposite way so this one here goes whoops this fiber here goes this way because the other one's going that way. <clears throat> so what sits on top of there? Now let's get back to what sits on top of there. Let's put down your angels. Let's get this back in here and see how that affects stuff. So what happens is, see all these attachments here? Like these little attachments, they go right into the pelvic floor right there. They go, th and see, they go through the connective tissue. They go through that fascia right into the pelvic floor. So if my fascia is contracted over here, and if, and it can be tracted over here through fear around the bladder. If it's fear on the feminine side, I'm going to be contracted more. Literally, I'm going to have more contraction here on the masculine side over there. So it's going to pull and rotate the uterus. So that's one way. And this is all solved by fascial maneuvers. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are some other common issues? I know I'm a fan of what's efficient so okay. that you don't have to work hard to get a result because we're always focused on, you know, whether it's working on a muscle to strengthen something but here you know when you're resolving things to the fascia what i noticed even personally was oh the glutes started to engage on their own finally when they were not and it didn't matter what you're trying to do so these little muscles start mm -hmm. to engage on their own the reason why that happens is because when you do the rotations of the fascial maneuvers it lets the hip settle mm -hmm. and so the glutes then start these start firing again that makes sense mm -hmm. Yeah, so if my glutes fire, my glute minimus fires differently, which creates the levators to fire differently, which means that my pelvic floor is going to sit differently. My uterus is going to sit differently. And just think about all those obstructed labors. Right. Childbirth. Yeah, childbirth, obstructed mm -hmm. labors. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about some of the, the ones that everybody wants to know. Okay, so during pregnancy, now the human body is a bag. So the skin is a bag, there's pressure inside. We divide the pressure into three zones. We divide the pressure from here up, zone one, <clears throat> zone two to the pelvic floor, from here to here, and zone three. So if I change pressure here, it has to change pressure here and here, and vice versa. So what does that look like when you're pregnant? Well, when you're pregnant, this goes like this. So if that goes like that, it's pulling this way. The bag has to go this way. So women get shorter when they're pregnant. The average woman gets between an inch and a half and two inches mm -hmm. shorter when they're pregnant. So, and, and for all you women out there who've gotten shorter when you're pregnant, do you want to get your height back? So what happens is, is we have all this pressure out here, but what starts to support is this. You start to see that, that all the muscles and fascia back here start to tighten to hold the body from going forward. Because if the body's right here, this has to tighten in order for this to go here. So this has to tighten because the force angle is down like this. So this is an area for women. If you want to re-get rid of your, your rec dias recti, one of the areas to work is right here, is to make sure that this area is clear. Now we get this area clear with our anti-gravity fascial maneuver because we actually stretch that out. Okay, so let's talk about the mastectomy. Um, how do you feel about mastectomies as a medical doctor? Uh, do you mean the reason why people go and have them or? 
Well, I, I mean, that. we have them usually because of cancer. Mm -hmm. Do you treat cancer really differently than the regular medical establishment? Uh, yes, but I can't claim to treat cancer. You can't claim to treat, mm -hmm. uh, you can't claim to treat cancer? Is that a legal thing? Mm. Well, uh, how does that work? Mm -hmm. If anything, it's trying to, again, it's a holistic approach right. to address. Um, oh, the whole body. Okay, okay. Uh, so you're treating it from the holistic approach. Okay, yeah, I don't treat a disease either. Treat the whole body. But I mean, in medicine, we treat cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. But if we treat cancer, we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. We have to treat the whole body. Okay, so, um, so mastectomy. So what, what happens in a mastectomy from your point of view? Well, physically, I mean, they might feel that they can remove the cancer, but then you're left with all the, the scars. Yeah. You don't know what's happening at a you know, blood vessel, cell level that way. Um, but I think the biggest thing is the scars um, and the disruption in, well, when I think in energy flow and also fascia as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, so we got this, we got the scars. So, and this is also, let's give another one for mastectomy, but also for uh, augmentation, breast augmentation, either post or pre either for aesthetics or not. So one of what things for me is I actually, you can actually push your finger inside of my nipple. Go ahead, push it in, push hard. Feel that hole. Mm -hmm. I had a bilateral gynecomastia oh. surgery. So I had my breast tissue removed because I was a bodybuilder. And I didn't want to get what we call bitch tits. So I am very familiar with when people say, all you people say, how can a guy talk about breast augmentation and that? Because I had mine augmented. So yeah, reduction. reduction. Yeah, I had, re I had a breast reduction. <laughs> so, so normally what we're going to do is the, the most common treatments um, for uh, augmentation is we're going to cut right here. We're going to cut right here or we're going to cut right here. They all have different effects. So from a health perspective. Sometimes they have the down, down the. Yeah, they'll, they'll go. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's mm -hmm. actually. Oh, shoot. I got rid of them all here, here and here. And sometimes they go right down mm -hmm. there, which is, they, which is, in my opinion, the same thing as the old C-section scars. Mm -hmm. It's like brutal. Like, why, where are we cutting through this? So around here, what are the things that are that are affected when we when we cut off the, the nipple? What are the from a from a. Uh, a holistic point of view. I mean, that's all the stomach. Stomach, you know? right. Yeah. What is stomach? It's desire. Mm -hmm. So this affecting desire massively. So yeah, the stomach channel. And I guess what I've had my whole issue, my whole life, stomach issues. Mm -hmm. My entire life I've had stomach issues. Okay, what about when we cut under here? Well, you're still transecting stomach. And depending how far out that goes, a bit of kidney. Kidney, mm -hmm. a little bit of spleen. Perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Depending on where they do it. This one. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Spleen and gallbladder mm -hmm. over here. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but, but we're going to, so if we affect the spleen, then what is one of the emotions that will happen? Worry. Worry. Mm -hmm. So do you notice a lot of women today have worry? Oh, they have worry. Yeah. Do you notice women who have breast augmentations tend to worry a little bit more? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to know which came first, though, sometimes. You, fair, fair statement, fair statement. But as a society looking at them, yeah. if I look at them, women who have breast augmentations have more worry generally mm -hmm. is the way I feel. And then over here, we're going to get spleen or we're going to get gallbladder. But and if I do this, what are some of the symptoms I might experience in breast augmentation? If I get gallbladder, what's that going to affect? Well, sometimes it could be things like their decision making, mm -hmm. their sense of courage or frustration yeah resentment frustration and and then what's it going to affect in the way that they eat and process it's going to affect the way they digest food mm -hmm. yeah so gallbladder being um gallbladder being uh, what we need for fats mm -hmm. yeah so it's going to affect the bile production mm -hmm. uh, so that's a pretty big price to pay for an augmentation now what about somebody who already so somebody who already has an augmentation Here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that when we move the tissue around here, it, the body is really, really powerful. As soon as we, we take away the, the issue and we, we pull apart the tissue, we creating, basically we're creating friction, pulling apart a contraction. The body heals itself. But if it heals itself from a cut, it can heal itself from that too. Mm -hmm. But we just have to give it. So basically what I tell people, women to do is stretch the nipple, stretch under there, stretch the scar this way, stretch it this way. Stretch it that way, stretch it that way, stretch it all the way around. Same thing with the nipple. 
I also encourage them to grab the breast from here and pull up, put one hand on the breast, put one hand here, pull the breast up, and then flex around and move so it opens up the fascia in here. That's stomach, spleen, kidney, stuff like that. So this is, by the way, this affects their energy too. Absolutely. Okay, now there's another thing that happens with augmentation that you'll see is that the shoulders tend to roll inward. Mm-hmm. Now the shoulders roll inward, what it's affecting this little line right here. Lung. That's lung. So that means I'm going to be, if I affect my lung, I'm going to be more anxious. And it's going to, it's going to have me processing more grief. Is that a true statement? Yeah, it can be. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to, because the large intestine goes here, I'm going to be processing more of this because this is blocked. Okay. So, so here we have something that they can do for this and we will do a video for this on how to remediate this. Okay. Other health issues. So what do you say normally with HRT? Do you agree with HRT? No, okay. I, I don't see it quite as much as it used to be, at least. Well, I mean, it was really big for about 20 years. Everybody was doing it. Now it's become more bioidentical. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, bioidentical. What do you think about it, bioidentical? Uh, I think it's the same thing, but in a more, um, I guess it's a, it's a nicer package for people to take, you know? Right. But it's still... The same thing. Mm-hmm. We're augmenting the body's hormonal mm-hmm. cycle, which the hormones are a reaction to the environment. It's the body's best way of reacting to the environment. It doesn't understand something, so it's, it's misre- misfiring hormones. So if we just make it easy, it's like giving us a crutch. Yeah. So if I wear a crutch long enough, I'm not going to be able to walk. That's right. Okay, so what I, my answer is reduce the stress in the body, reduce it twice a day for 28 days. And if we do that, it resets the stress cycle. So most of the hormone replacement therapy is because the body's been in stress too often. We've been firing adrenaline, cortisol, norepinephrine. We've been firing that as our daily working. That's why I tell people when they get up in the morning, the very first thing I tell them to do is do fascial maneuvers because they're restricted. They want to, they want to stretch in the morning. So if, if they want to stretch and I move through that stretching, what I'm actually doing is that movement through the stretching is causing my body to have stress hormones to move. So that I'm already in sympathetic right in the morning. That's why I do fascial maneuvers in the morning. Because I don't, I don't get my body into stress first thing. Okay, so uh, the body holds fluid. Fluid, water is the universal solvent that takes trauma and cleans trauma out of the body. So when the body's holding water, so like I'll give you an example. So this is the way I see fat, by the way. So I don't see fat the same way. People can argue with me all they want. But at the end of it, they usually end up with something in their body. All the ones who argue with me usually have something in their body that doesn't work at some point and they're sick and they want help with it. And then they stop arguing. Um, That's usually what happens because I get a lot of practitioners that would argue about this stuff. But okay, here's the what I see. Okay, if I have a lot of anger, my body is going to hold water around the liver. If I hold that water, it sits there waiting for the emotion to release. If the emotion doesn't release, which is the toxins, then that water is going to stay there. If the water stays there long enough, it's going to start to get putrid and brownish. If it stays there really long, it's going to get whitish. Hmm. And it's going to become another tissue, kind of like calcification starts to calcify a bone. Does that make sense if I said to you? Interesting. Yeah. Never thought of it that way. Yeah, I see it all the time. Because if somebody who's, who's got a lot of anger issues will have swelling around their liver or a lot of desire or worry issues will have swelling around their stomach. So I see that all the time. So if we need to even take out the liver here. And there we go. There's your nasty gallbladder or your pretty gallbladder, however you want to say it. But so if we take the stomach right here, and I'll see this a lot. Um, I'll see that, that there's a lot of water around here. So this part of the body quite often what I'll see is this part of the body here gets swollen so that it causes more swelling on the left side. And, but that what actually causes a rotation of the rib cage. So a torquing of the rib cage, which is then resolved in the neck or the hips again. Mm-hmm. So what I tell people is, is that when we do fascial maneuvers, what we're doing is we're causing rotation here, rotation here, and rotation here. Those rotations are going here, 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 and then these are balancing off. These are like mitigating the differences. So this is why when we do this, it opens up the fascial layers here. So it opens up the diaphragm so that they can get movement there again. And movement is what mo- moves it out. So if it's stuck there, I find that the organ will get stuck. And then I remove the organ, then the body starts to move. Mm-hmm. 
I wanted to go back to something you said when you're telling people to do the fascial maneuvers twice a day to re reduce your stress, because yeah. a lot of times, you know, people are all about, they need to reduce their stress, get rid of stress. So they're always thinking something external or something they have to change. But the beautiful thing about these exercises is that they're actually literally reducing the stress in their body, mm -hmm. you know, and reducing, you know, the nervous uh, system reset. And then through that, when they become clear, they might make choices externally. Okay. Yeah. But I think that advice for people is always hard is how do they reduce stress because they're overwhelmed by stress. Right. When you give them that tool that they start to, it's that connection they'll start to regain in their body again of when stress is actually reducing, but it's inside of them. Right. So what I like to say to people is stress isn't work or your job or the mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. or that's stressor. Stress is my reaction to it. So my body's ability to react to it is determines the amount of stress. Mm -hmm. And but that that's not always obvious until someone can actually experience it. Right. They have to experience it. Themselves. Yeah, they have yeah. to feel it. That, that's actually what you felt when you first did fashion maneuvers. Absolutely. Reduction of stress. Really so if from a, if, as a as a doctor if I was to reduce stress twice every day, reset my baseline, I did nothing else, would that impact my disease? Absolutely. Is there any disease that would not be positively impacted by that? Well, we can see firsthand that stress aggravates any condition right. or disease. So that has to be the first step. So, so by reducing stress, we're affecting disease positively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. And not being able to give people something uh, that can actually do that, right, from a Western medical model. And yes, people can come in and do therapies to have it temporarily feel less stress. It might last a day or a few days, but, you know, giving them a tool that they can do easily. Right. That's why fashion maneuvers, because you can do it it's anywhere, amazing. anytime. That's why it's such an amazing tool. So uh, here's a question. Does working out reduce stress? It's another stress on it's the an, body. It's, an and it's, it's a catabolic action. Oh yeah, it's a stress on the body, but people are just, it's an outlet because they don't know what to do with all that pent up you know, energy. energy. So, so the most anxious people love to run. Yes. Right? Yeah, that's what we say. They're in their primitive state if they have to work out in order mm -hmm. to, to feel good. Mm -hmm. So then here's one. Does yoga, is it anabolic or catabolic? Because yoga actually works the muscle. The muscle skeletal system, when you work it, it causes stress. So basically, if I give my body enough adrenaline, norepinephrine, and cortisol, if I give my body speed, it slows down, right? Mm -hmm. So those, those drugs are speed. So if we are actually doing yoga, we're actually stressing the body to then get a relaxation. Mm -hmm. Where fascial maneuvers, we're actually releasing the, the restriction without uh, engaging the muscle skeletal systems who are not engaging the hormones to do it. Every other movement process engages the hormones to do it. Probably yoga forms where there's more breath. Well, that would be yin, 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 yin yoga. Mm -hmm. Yin yoga is slow movement because if we're, if we're trying to hold a muscular mm -hmm. form, then that causes the shaking. That's when they try to hold it and they can't shake and they shake. But I will say personally, I, I did do a yin yoga practice that I enjoyed, but I got an injury from it because there were fascial restrictions up higher as I'm trying to stretch into something lower, the hamstring gave up. And that was on your left side? Yeah. But didn't we just fix that today? Well, yeah, but these are my old injuries, right? Yeah, so where it was bound up before. How long ago was that? This was a few years ago, three, four years ago. And we just fixed that today. Oh yeah, but my left side has been compounding over time, but yeah. you know, 95% of it resolved just through doing all the things and then you kind of tied Touched up it. Yeah. the yeah. rest of it. Yeah, no, I, that's a really, really good point. That's a super, super good point. Okay, what else do we got here? What do you say about PCOS? Well, I mean, we're traditionally thinking it's hormonal. Right. Mm -hmm. And do you think that? Do you feel that way? Mm. Anything hormonal is an imbalance in the body. So yes, in some ways, it's about restoring balance and uh, clearing the congestion in the lower the lower uh, pelvic. Yeah, so, yeah so, so if we clear congestion in the lower pelvic region, we can get rid of PCOS. So mm -hmm. we have our lower reset, which is all the lower maneuvers. That would be a good one for PCOS. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's all about re 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 removing restrictions in the lower, in the pelvis and the lower part of it. Mm -hmm. So that would be a good one. Mm -hmm. um, 
So PCOS, what I say is the lower reset, uh, one to two times per day, um, getting the body hydrated, uh, diatomaceous earth, IRC moss. Uh, if you can do it and you can afford to do it, get our foundation bundle of supplements. Do that every day for 28 days, one to two times. And then usually, uh, we can't say it cures your disease, but we can say that tens of thousands of people that had PCOS no longer have symptoms. That's what we can say. <laughs> oh, what's your opinion on birth control? <laughs> This would be good. So, okay, what's the medical, what's the established medical opinion on birth control? Oh, it's prescribed freely. Yeah, and what do we prescribe it for? Uh, regulate periods, acne, of course, contraception. They'll give it towards the perimenopausal years, right? To even out menopausal, perimenopausal bleedings. Yeah, it's- So basically everything. Easily. Basically, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like aspirin for women, <laughs> right? So, so what? It's a uh, convenient way to uh, manipulate. So, if I was doing steroids, things. is that effectively the same thing on my body as doing birth control over time? Possibly, yes. Yeah. So, putting hormones into my body exogenously. So, it's the same as a steroid. It has the same kind of effect, maybe slightly different organs that it's because mm -hmm. one is is driving more testosterone and one's driving more estrogen. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to be good. Now, what about the what about the smell factor? What about the women being able to smell their partner? So, so going off of birth control and then changing their relationships. Have you seen that in your practice? I don't know if firsthand if I've seen that, but I've certainly seen a number of women who cannot tolerate these hormones. Yeah. And for good reason. Yeah, for good reason, yeah. Um, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So what are the other forms of birth control well, that, you, that you recommend then? Mm -hmm. if you, uh, really, it's just natural. Uh, Knowing your own cycle? Yeah, but you know, with that is always a potential that it might not work. And yeah, but if I, if I knew exactly when I'm ovulating, if I could feel it, and I knew exactly when I wasn't, yeah. then I would be safe. Yeah, this is about women's wisdom inside their bodies. Right, so we've taken away the wisdom inside the bodies because we no longer teach them what it feels like yeah. when you're ovulating. So yeah. if you don't know what it feels like when you're ovulating, you just start ovulating. And especially if you've been given these things at a young age. Right, okay, Lydia, osteoporosis, osteoprena. So here's my, so when, you're, when your body's not working properly, your blood is going to regulate the body. It's like, um, think about the radiator in your car. It makes the car, the engine colder when it's hotter outside and hotter when it's colder. Your blood is supposed to be neutral. And when your blood doesn't have enough calcium in it, it's gonna get the calcium. Where does it get the calcium from? Your bones. So if you're trying to deal with osteoporosis and osteopenia and you're giving yourself more calcium, you're causing calcification of your body. It's not gonna work. That's not how the body works. What you do is you go to why you're, why you're having deficiency in the first place. Um, if you want more calcium in your body, start loading up your silica, diatomaceous earth or silica from horsetail, immediately you'll notice a difference in your bones. Your bones have more silica in them than they do calcium, but we're not taught that. So we're taught to give our body something that we're deficient. But if our body's deficient, that's our body's way of managing or coping with whatever else is going on. So if we give our body something we're deficient in, like if I go take a lab test, that's why I don't like doing lab tests anymore, and I'm deficient in C and D, I, and I start taking C and D, my body is not going to then produce the right response somewhere else. So I'm gonna have an issue that builds up. Fair statement, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Endometriosis, maybe we should describe what that is first. Um, so the uh, endometrial is inside the uterus. Mm -hmm. So it comes outside of the uterus and it's like a webby kind of material. It goes inside the pelvic floor mm -hmm. and it can twist around the organs and all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. But why does it come out of the pelvic floor, do you think? First of all, endometriosis, have you noticed that its incidence has been rising? Like you almost didn't see it 20, 30 years ago. And today it's like 20% it's like of the population of women. Mm -hmm. Have you yes. noticed that change? There's certainly a lot of women who are having troubles with their cycles yeah. and um, perhaps more endometriosis yeah, in my practice. Mm -hmm. so, so we have endometriosis coming up. So, so basically we have all this fibrous stuff that squeezes out of the uterus, goes into the pelvic floor. And then when we have our cycle, it has the same behavior as the tissue in the uterus. Mm -hmm. So it expands and contracts. Now, this is when I say, people say the uterus doesn't expand during um, mm -hmm. to your cycle. Well, then what is the endometrial tissue? What is, what's it doing? Mm -hmm. So if you had that uterus, remember what it looked like. What if we just squished it? 
Wouldn't that push tissue out? Mm -hmm. So can you imagine that this, the tissue is getting squeezed out of it? <clears throat> so that would cause from pelvic issues. Now, what are women doing today? They're making their butts bigger while working out. They're tightening up their abs. They're getting ripped and shredded, which is dehydrated of their organs. We know that. Super bad for them. Um, everybody who looks like they're in shape um, has, in my, in my experience, has massive dehydration of organs and organ issues and hormone dysregulation. Every single person I, that looks aesthetically pleasing. So when you squeeze that abdomen, squeeze the pelvis, and you put a massive weight, what they're doing is they put weights on like this, and they bridge up like this, causing all the pressure right in here, right over the uterus. That's going to squeeze the uterus. So what I've noticed is lots of women who are athletes, um, like that kind of athlete, like we're talking fitness models, IFBB models that are trying to, I noticed that they have the highest incident of endometriosis. Interesting. That's my experience mm. in my practice. But this is clinical experience. It's by what you see. Yeah, this is only what I see. Yeah. And I've seen 15,000 women personally, or sorry, 15,000 people, 70% of the women personally I've seen, spent two hours or more with them, seen them through course of treatment, watched them through various of one of the 52 practitioners. So I've had, that was my experience. And, I, and I, the thing that I feel is different about my experience is that I got to see, I, I talked to everybody for an hour and a half to two hours before we touched them. Now, can you imagine doing that in a medical practice? Oh, that, no. that does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> so endometriosis, the first thing I'd say that even if we do the surgery, quite often it recurs. That means that the pressure, something's squeezing it out. So we have to take the pressure off. to the off. root of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we do for endometriosis is the lower reset. Um, and uh, on the psoas release, which is really an organ release, you do the same thing over your bladder. You do that every single day. You do that before you come into your cycle. There's a set of oils. If you go to our YouTube channel and there's a essential oil wizardry, there's a workshops. There's one on women's health issues. There's a set of oils in there, one called moon cycle that you rub on uh, two days before your cycle and through your cycle. Super important, it calms, it calms the body down, it calms the hormones down, it causes regulation. And there's some other ones in there, I'll let you go and watch the, the podcast. But here's what's really important for guys who can't sleep, put moon cycle on your feet. 30 minutes, if you can stay up after 30 minutes with moon cycle on your feet, yeah, write me a note, I'll bring you up. I mean, it crashed me online. I couldn't even stay up, we put it on our, our feet. And Jason and I just went right in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> couldn't even stay up. So, so that's what I recommend for endometriosis. Uh, you have to have your body hydrated because the tissue that you're trying to get to go back in, if it's dehydrated, if the fascia is dehydrated, it creates adhesions in those fascial layers around the organs. It needs to be slippery and slimy and be able to get back into, the, into there. And I, my experience is, is that that tissue is still attached in there usually, so it can come back You're out. You're saying the implanted endometrial tissue will go back into the uterus? I have it sometimes. I think it's, if it's not cut off, if it's not separated from the uterus, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can come out and sometimes it leaches out and separates, sometimes it's cut off. Mm -hmm. But if they've done the surgery, they've already cut it. It's like tentacles coming out. Mm -hmm. Those tentacles were wrapping the baby before. Thought. Yeah. I mean, I may be wrong, but yeah. But they must have um, uh, repeatable patterns of they, they do. in their body. Right yeah, so endometriosis. Um, it's usually really, really thin, narrow, trying to pressure, doing a lot of ab workouts, doing a lot of got to have those abs, the six pack abs. Like that is the that's the indicator that when somebody comes in and they said endometriosis, I just look at their body type. That's the first thing, and the other one can be excessive weight causing pressure when I sit down. So excessive weight pushing down on the uterus mm -hmm. can also cause the same thing. So for women who are very, you know, focused on that fit aesthetic, mm -hmm. doing fascial maneuvers, does it give? Yeah, so what it does is it, well, fascial maneuvers automatically start to expand the tissue and expand, it, it, takes, it takes all of the contraction because what that is, is they're contracting and dehydrating muscle tissue and fascial tissue around there to create that look. Mm -hmm. But you can still have a slim look. There's a difference between a woman who's thin or a guy who's thin and has, you can see abs and one that's ripped and shredded and stuff like that. There's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. So it's not all, it's not working out that's causing the issue. It's the working out, the constant pressure, the focus on one area. Because if you work out the whole body, no problem. Yeah, but if you yeah. work out to get your butt bigger, something else has to, has to compensate. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm.
What what is it done? What has doing faster maneuvers done for you? Now you're you've gone through the twenty eight day reset. Mm -hmm. So what was your experience in going through that as a medical doctor? Uh, well, I mean, I I'm a medical doctor and I work energetically, holistically. So what I noticed was as a physical modality, it actually um, puts one through a journey similar as if I was doing an energetic treatment, sure. but it was coming from the <clears throat> physical handle. And so not only were the physical uh, restrictions and limitations from old injuries unwinding, the emotions that are stored in the body, the subconscious, old traumas that would release. Um, and then really feeling the contrast of the reset, you know, it's such a good word, the nervous system resetting, you know, the past few years have been pretty, you know, pretty challenging rough. and traumatic. Yeah, especially on you. Yes, yeah. especially on me. I'm not a, a, a conventional doctor, so I wouldn't have conventional views during pandemic. And, uh, and that comes with its consequences. So with that amount of stress and challenge, you know, that I've never faced in my lifetime till this point, uh, I was definitely in a form of fear, stress response. And um, being reset out of that, I can say clear as day, I've been in a parasympathetic state consistently. So what has that done to your life? What has it done to your, like, your, the way you feel about yourself? Well, um, it took off the feeling of being oppressed and burdened uh, to becoming lighthearted, the capacity for joy to return, to laugh, to feel playful, to feel younger in my body. I've told you, I, I came into skiing in my adulthood and to be able to ski moguls in trees and do big drops, I never did that before. And this is just after, this is during the 28 this day is, reset. Yeah. While you're and, in the process. Yeah, I mean, in December I went skiing and in January I went skiing. It was a completely different experience. I thought, what was I doing before? Right. That Because now I feel like I'm actually skiing, skiing and having fun and I'm actually feeling young. And, you know, I can watch my daughter go, oh, this is her experience. She's not thinking. She's you just go doing with it. the flow. And it's just been being in flow, being fluid. And that also means on a energetic or spiritual sense, you're more... Uh, guided and connected. You know, what is it? To... What has it done with your relationships? Well, something that I was lacking before, you know, was boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say that during the, uh, the maneuvers, I started to understand and feel this organic sense of what boundaries were in a way that I didn't understand mm -hmm. before. And I wasn't consciously trying to create hard boundaries. It was just you know, this beautiful sense of knowing where I was, my groundedness and what was okay and what wasn't okay and being in truth. And that's really, I think the theme of the last three years is how to be in truth, in integrity and to not be in fear. And so, you know, these maneuvers came in a time in my life where that was- There's a, there's a lot of fear in the medical profession and without going too far into it, cause I don't want to focus on the problem. We've got 30 to 50% of the healthcare workers worldwide gone. Um, the next two years, uh, how can the system maintain itself? Yeah, Practically, it's like, yeah, it's like we have more people going into the system than we did. We have uh, 30 to 50 percent less people to manage it. Um, it's not healthy. So that's so what is this done to what is doing this practice done to your relationship to what you do for work? You know, you can't change anything external to yourself. Things are happening around us. But what we can change is what's inside. Mm -hmm. And what's happening here helps us to then respond to what's out here. I have passion and inspiration. Yeah. And I feel that there's a way forward, an evolution that can come.